With each passing day, that the disregard, uh, disgraced, twice impeached, four times indicted ex-president moves ever closer to winning the Republican nomination. The vision of a second Trump administration is becoming clearer. Take a look at these headlines. The Atlantic devoting an entire issue to the subject of a second Trump term with the words, if Trump wins. From the New York Times, why a second Trump presidency may be more radical than the first. And this, from The Guardian, a second Trump term will be far more autocratic than the first. He's telling us. Just a few days ago, an op-ed in the Washington Post read, a Trump dictatorship is increasingly inevitable. We should stop pretending. The through line through all of this chilling reporting is a warning. Donald Trump could transform every institution that comes under the sway of the presidency, from the Justice Department to the federal bureaucracy that makes every government agency tick to the alliances that underpin our foreign policy. And don't assume that Trump will fall short of his goals like he did so often in his first term. A second term Trump would be different. As David Frum writes in The Atlantic, quote, in his first term, Trump's corruption and brutality were mitigated by his ignorance and his laziness. In a second Trump term, he would arrive with a much better understanding of the system's vulnerabilities, more willing enablers in tow, and much more focused agenda of retaliation against his adversaries and impunity for himself. When people wonder what another Trump term might hold, their minds underestimate the chaos that would lie ahead. There are signs that the warnings are pushing through the noise of the election campaign, forcing Donald Trump to address it himself. The Washington Post reports Republican polling leader uh, Donald Trump moved to deflect from the criminal charges that he tried to overturn the 2020 election and from his own pledges to take revenge on his opponents if he returns to the White House, seeking to parry warnings that he presents a danger to democracy. His speech on Saturday was an effort to turn the table on rising alarms from Democrats and some Republicans that Trump's return to power would imperil free elections and civil liberties. One of those Republicans, former Congresswoman Liz Cheney, her criticism of Trump cost her her political career. Her work on the January 6th uh, Select Committee revealed the depths to which Donald Trump and his allies worked to overturn the will of the voters. Here she is on the Today Show. You've said we are sort of sleepwalking into dictatorship in the United States. Dictatorship. Is that what we yeah. would have if we reelect Donald Trump? I think it's, it's a very, very real threat and concern. And, and I don't say any of that lightly. And frankly, um, it's painful for me as someone who, you know, has spent her whole life in uh, Republican politics, who grew up as a Republican, to watch what's happening to my party uh, and, and to watch the extent to which Donald Trump himself um, has, uh, you know, basically determined that that uh, the only thing that matters is uh, him, his power, his success, and um, that is not somebody you can entrust with the power of the presidency. And that's where we start this hour with the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, Jeffrey Goldberg, the co-founder and executive director at Project Democracy, Ian Bassan, and with me at the table, the senior political reporter for Puck News, Tara Palmieri. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jeff, I, I think you can divide the world into three, right? Our America into three. There's the, 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 the MAGA folks who are not subscribing to your magazine. Uh, there are Republicans, Democrats, former Republicans, whatever you call it, the people who think that Donald Trump shouldn't be uh, elected again, uh, many of whom will be watching us right now. And then there's the kind of everyone else. And, and it seems to me that your addition here is hopefully for that everyone else who's you know, playing footsie with lower taxes and less regulation or whatever it is they think they want out of government and warning them that what you might get is something entirely different. And you're not guessing at it. You're using Donald Trump's own words and strategies to make that determination. Right. Um, I would disagree with you on one point. I, I think some of our best readers are probably MAGA people, but let's put that aside All for right, right now. Enough. I think we do have them. And I think we do. I think we do have some people who vote for Trump for this reason or that reason and, and are committed to that. And that's fine. I want them to read this. But you're, you're, you're right. There's a small group of people, and that's we, we understand about American politics, that there's always a small group of undecideds. There are people who are on the fence um, who, as you say, you know, think, oh, ta taxation policies, maybe 
there are issue specific people who think you know the the good that he'll do outweighs the bad that he'll do um and and yes that was the the, the point of this issue was that look we have a large core of excellent writers who've been covering different aspects of trump for years now and so i just asked them a simple question based on what you know based on what he did based on what he said he will do what will he what will a second trump administration do in the area of of, of your concern so we have immigration and military and obviously abortion politics and, and 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 but it's but it's it's more than that it's about a it's about a, an authoritarian disposition how does donald trump who obviously has no respect for the Constitution. How does Donald Trump come back into office, and what will he do to undermine the structures uh, and, the, and the and the and the and the, the the safety systems that we have built to protect our democracy? And so much of the issue is focused on 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 that. And and again, as you point out aptly, um, he this is the the stuff isn't secret. Right. You know, he 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 tells us how he feels um, and and it's just up to us to listen. So I thought maybe we can put this all together in one place. And um, not that, you know, it's it's past Thanksgiving, but you still have access to your, you know, your dyspeptic uncle. Right. And and maybe maybe someone can hand them, uh, you know, this issue and say, look, just read this through. It's all fact checked. Yeah. It's all it's all there. It's all in his own language. And 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 then make your decision. That's the hope of all of these discussions. Ian, the last time you were on TV, you were with us. You, you made the point, as as Jeffrey just did, that whether your biggest uh, issues are immigration or border or climate or taxation or regulation, that's not the issue. The issue of our time is the preservation of democracy. It's not even a uniquely American issue, but it is that's the thing you have to vote on, regardless of what you want to happen in any of those other areas. Yeah, we're living through a global recession of democracy where these illiberal authoritarian leaders are coming to power around the world through elections and then dismantling their democratic systems from within. And what we're facing here in the United States, I think, is an imagination problem. And appropriately, in the in the issue that Jeffrey was just talking about of The Atlantic that just came out, David Froome begins his piece with exactly this point that we as a nation, and especially key actors in this country, are struggling to imagine what it could look like for our democracy to go away. I will just say over the last seven years, I've had numerous conversations with Republican elected officials where they view Donald Trump, and they will tell you this privately, as embarrassing, as corrupt, as incompetent, but they cannot imagine that he could be so dangerous as to dismantle and end the American Republic that has existed for the last 246 years. And yet everything that we're seeing suggests that's possible. And I, I think the Atlantic could, cannot get enough praise for the job it's done trying to break through that imagination problem over the last several years. And if you look back at what the Atlantic has written in the past to determine how much credit you should give to what they published today, look at what David Frum wrote in the Atlantic in March 2017. Almost everything he predicted about the direction Trump was heading has come to pass. Look at what Bart Gelman wrote about the crisis that could befall the 2020 election in the fall of that year. These authors have been correct in the past, and we should credit what they're saying today and take that warning seriously. Tara, there are mechanical reasons mm. why this will be different. You're right. Uh, Donald Trump has said all the things he's going to do. There's Project 2025. But there are ways in which this current Trump operation, the, the, the world, the Trump world as we have it right now, is different from the way things were when he was first president. And that alone will help him to achieve more of his goals if he's reelected. Absolutely. Uh, when I was covering Trump in the first years, it was all about leaks to stop his worst, um, his worst desires. And it is not the case anymore. He's got three people at the top, Susie Wiles, Chris Lasavita, Jason Miller, and they are supplicants. They make sure that his actions are effectuated. And they've actually done a lot on the campaign campaign trail in terms of just changing the delegate system to work in their favor. And there aren't as many leaks. Trump is guarded. He's very afraid of even his friends that he used to call the time outside of the White House who would then leak to try to stop things. It's not a uh, gang of rivals anymore. Right. It is it is Trump loyalists, and it will be Trump loyalists. They've had all these years to go through the resumes and try to flag anyone who seems like they might in any way defy his orders. So we're not going to get the heads up when he tries to pull out of NATO. We're not going to get the heads up when he tries right. to round up, you know, um, 
migrants. That's not the process. And, you know, journalism, democracy, and, and that's just not going to be a facet because he'll be able to effectuate it before we even know. Uh, Jeffrey, let me read a little bit from this uh, this article uh, that you have uh, the, the the issue that you published in uh, one called "Loyalist Lapdogs and Cronies." The available supply of serious this is to the point that Tara was just making. The available supply of serious qualified people willing to serve in a Trump administration has dwindled since 2017. After all, the so-called adults didn't fare so well in their respective rooms. Some quit in frustration or disgrace. Others were publicly fired by the president. Several have spent their post-White House lives fielding congressional subpoenas and getting indicted. Even if mainstream Republicans did want to work for him again, Trump is unlikely to want them. He's made little secret of the fact that he felt burned by many in his first cabinet. This time around, according to people in Trump's orbit, he would prioritize obedience over credentials. And that's the direction we start to go in, which talks about uh, uh, autocracy and dictatorship and fascism, obedience over credentials. Right. Uh, you know, at the, he, he, from his perspective, he made a mistake in his first term, right? He hired the so-called grown-ups, Jim Mattis and Rex Tillerson and John Kelly and, and, and so on, right? And they, as Tara notes, they, they checked his worst impulses and they figured out how to work around it and sort of mitigate it. N n there's no more of that. Like the people around Donald Trump now are absolute loyalists and they're going to be hiring for loyalty above everything else. He doesn't want anybody from the Washington establishment. The shame here, and I, and I want to make this point because it's important, this is not about conservatism or liberalism or libertarianism or anything, right? Not at all. There are yeah. plenty of conservatives in in Washington, in government, um, who would be able public servants, and I believe, and the Atlantic believes, as a matter of you know, as a matter of principle, that a, sh a healthy democracy has a strong liberal party and a strong conservative party, at least at, at the very least, right? So this is not about ideology. This is about a an authoritarian predisposition, and one thing that an authoritarian needs is loyalty above everything else, loyalty above competence, loyalty, loyalty above um, respect for the Constitution, respect for law and respect for norms. And that's what that's what we're talking about now.